Man, what a sweet time, amen, of praise and worship that was. Thank you for singing out and praising the Lord together with us. And as we continue on now, we pray that that sweet spirit would continue on as we continue now uh, with this service through the Word of God. I do want to take just a moment, though, and, and recognize some things from last night. Uh, last night, as you know, we had our trunk or treat, and uh, man, we had uh, over 1,300 people come uh, come through our campus last night, and I'm telling you, it was an amazing time. God blessed us with ideal weather, and we had a, there was a sweet spirit here, and I, I've had several people in the, that had the trunks that told me the same thing, that people came through with such a sweetness about them, and how they appreciated what we're doing, even more than what we have, have ever had before. So I want to thank you, church, for being a part of that, for from our ERT folks who were here to, to help assist in the parking and doing everything they did to uh, the, all of you who brought your cars here and set out and, and gave out candy and to all of you who prayed for us for last night and for all of you who gave candy. Man, we, we did well. God, God was honored and glorified. So thank you, church for allowing us to be a part of such a great event as what we had last night. And it was, and I promise you, it will not go uh, just by the wayside. There, there was effectual things going on uh, last night. And so thank you for allowing us to do that. And thank you for participating in it and praying for it. And again, giving the candy uh, that we were able to give out and make a big difference uh, in, in people's lives. So uh, again, what a great night. And when you can get that many people coming across your campus, uh, it, it's a good thing. Amen. So we're looking forward now to what God has for us from here. And there's going to be some great things. Today, what I want to do is I want to continue on with my series of messages of, entitled For Such a Time as This. I believe, as I shared last week, that we have been positioned strategically by God in this time, in this place, for uh, Christians and, and for First Baptist West and for the members, each one of you, and for those here in attendance, those watching our, our live stream, God has placed us for such a time as this. We are at an important time in our nation's history. We have a big event coming up Tuesday. How many of y'all know what Tuesday is? We got a big one coming, amen? It's voting on Tuesday. If you haven't already voted, then I want to encourage you to, to be there and, and, and stand up. Church, it's time. I believe that God has placed the church and he has called the church. It's time to stand up. It's time to be recognized. It's time to, to be what God wants us to be. And so today what I want to do is I want to continue with the series for such a time as this. Now, it's out of the book of Esther where, where I started last week, but this week we're going to move on. Even though it's, the title is there, we're going to use another text of Scripture. We're going to go into a time of, of Israel's history to where some decisions were going to have to be made. They were called to stand up. They were called to make a choice. And my friends, can I tell you today that I believe with all my heart God is calling the church to make a choice. I believe He's calling us out. I believe it's time to no longer just sit back. It's no longer, it's time to no longer just let things go on around us. It's time for the church to be the church. And so we got some decisions to make, and we're going to be looking at those here in just a second. But I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Kings chapter 18, starting at verse 20. Now, this text, the background of this text, if you're not familiar with it, there's a, a prophet named Elijah, and Elijah was preaching the word of God, and there was a king, Ahab, who was a, an awful king, and his wife, Jezebel, who basically was ruin, ruining the nation of Israel, and, and God was going to call them into action, call Elijah into action. Ahab, as we're going to see, brought all the uh, prophets of Baal, and they were going to have a big contest between Jehovah God and Baal. And so Elijah was called in, and so the nation of Israel is all gathered together, and this is where we pick up today, that Elijah now is going to give a challenge to the nation of Israel, and I believe that God has called me today as the pastor of First Baptist West to give this church a, a not a challenge, but a, a directive, a, a, a call to say it's time, it's time. So let's pick up where, where we left off on chapter 18, verse 20. Let's go ahead and stand. We'll be reading these two, two verses of Scripture, 20 and 21. The Bible says, So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to the people and said, How long will you, will, will you falter between two opinions? 
If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the blessings you've given us. And, and God, as we gather here today, I, I, I thank you for the sweet time we had together in praising and worshiping you. God, I thank you for the heart of this congregation. I thank you for those at home, Lord, and watching on this live stream. God, I thank you for their participation in this time. And Lord, I believe this is an important time in our history. I believe, God, you've called the church, and I pray today that, that the call would go out, and God, that it would be done as you desire for it to be. And I pray, God, that what I say here today are not my words, but yours. I pray that this is not my message that I brought out, but Father, this is the message you gave me. And Father, I pray that the response from your people, from your church, would be as you desire for it to be. And Father, it is in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. The title of today's message is No More Faltering. No More Faltering. It's, in other words, it's, it's time to choose. It's time to stand up. It's time to move forward. The idea of, of falter basically is the idea of indecisiveness and wavering. The church can no longer be indecisive. The church can no longer be wavering back and forth, going from one way or the other. It is time, my friend, in, in this year, in this such a time as this, it is time for the church to stand up and it's time the church to be solid. Because Elijah told the nation of Israel, he asked them this question, how long will you falter? How long will you keep going back and forth? How long will you do these things? We know that the nation of Israel had a history of at one time men following God. Men, they'd be on fire for Jehovah God. And they would get over here and do everything that God wanted them to do. Then all of a sudden they would fall away. And they'd begin to take on the characteristics of the surrounding areas around them with their society. And then they would come back and they would come back over here and follow God again. And they would falter again. And Elijah finally came to him and says, how long are you going to continue to do this? How long are you going to be trying to go both directions? How long are you going to continue to falter? And he basically told him, he said, it is time for you to not do that any longer. It is time for you to decide who it is you're going to follow. And I mean then, he says, be strong and steadfast. Because at such a time as this, listen to me, the church needs to be strong. The church needs to be steadfast. The church needs to make a decision. And we a lot of times will say, well, have we not made the decision? We're Christians. Listen, we're Christians, but Christians can still falter. Amen? We can still be wishy-washy. We can still be going back and forth. We can be hot for God one moment, then we can be cold as ice the next moment. We can follow God what He wants, and then we can turn into doing whatever society wants. As a matter of fact, we not only do this in time, we do this sometimes from day to day. On Sunday morning, man, we're all about God, man. We're all for Him. We're going to come to worship. But then on come Monday morning through Saturday, we're living like the world. My friends, God came to us and He said, Hey, it's, how long are you going to do this, church? How long are you going to falter? It's time to be steadfast. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. He said, Be strong, be solid. Get on this solid ground. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Don't be going back and forth. Don't follow whatever may sound good at the moment. He says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. He says, church, I am now calling you out in this year, 2020, with all these great things that are happening, with things that, that, that could change the course of our nation. He says, I am telling you, church, it is time for you to be steadfast. You be immovable. You continue my work. Don't do what you want. Do what God wants you to do. It is time for us to be that. And then he tells us this. He promises this. He says, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Because sometimes I think we wonder, well, what do we get out of this? Is it going to be worth it? And God is telling us, man, it's time to stand up. It's time to be strong and time to realize that whatever you do in his name, he's going to honor it. So we see that we are so far from the call of God that he's placed on the church if we are wavering and we're for indecisive. So what I want to do today very quickly is I want to look at a couple of things about this idea. When faltering, what happens and what's going on in a church when a church is faltering? What's going on in a church when we are jumping back and forth, when we're hot one moment, cold the next, following God one time, then following the world? What happens when we falter? Well, the first thing that we need to understand is that when we're faltering, there's no definite direction. There's no focal point. 
We're going back and forth, and, and we begin to doubt things. It's begin to doubt the Word of God. We, we begin to say, well, I know what the Bible says, but can I tell you something? The most dangerous thing a Christian can do is say, I know what the Bible says, but... What we have just begun to do is doubt the effectiveness of this word. I know what it says, but. And so we begin to doubt what he wants from us. We begin to doubt what he's thinking. And so this idea of doubting is a very dangerous thing for us to do. Because there's no focal point. There's no standard that we're living by. There's nothing that we're aiming at. We're just going all over the place. And my friends, can I tell you, there's no room for the church to be doubting the Word of God. There's no room for the church to be doubting God's call today. We need to know what He wants. We need to be ready and sure that that what He has called us to do, we'll do. And we can't doubt. As a matter of fact, the problem with doubting, James 1.8 tells us this. James 1.8 says, He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. When we're double-minded, that means, again, I want to do this for a while, then I want to do this for a while. Can I tell you something that, that, that I wrote down here that, that really struck me when God laid this on my heart? Said, as a child of God, we aren't fully, fully satisfied with the world as we once were. Here's our problem. That once we have the Holy Spirit of God in us, we, we tend to go over here to the world, but then we, what we find out is this world doesn't really satisfy us anymore. It's not like it used to be. It's not as powerful, it's not as fulfilling as it used to be. So we're not satisfied here anymore. But then what we come and do is over here is we find out that the the, the second part that I wrote down is that but we uh, don't also enjoy the full communion of God either. Because we're so wrapped up in things of this world, we don't get the full communion with God. Now, let me tell you something. I'm not talking about the full salvation of God here, amen? Because can I tell you this, church, and those at home, Can I tell you that the moment I received Jesus Christ as my Savior, I am fully saved. Amen. I'm not partially saved. I'm not saved and working toward the completion. I am fully saved. As a matter of fact, I'm not aiming aiming at more of the Holy Spirit. That once I receive Jesus in my life, guess what? I receive all of the Holy Spirit. I receive all that there is. It all comes upon me. It all lives inside me. It's not something that I pray more toward. It's not something that I pray through. I get all of the Holy Spirit. But the problem is that there's this thing called communion or fellowship with God. And what happens is I come over here and I don't immerse myself in the things of God. I come over here and, and I dabble in it a while. But then that doesn't even fulfill me. So then I need a tendency to come back over here a little bit more and get wrapped up in the world. Well, so what happens is I'm now double-minded. I'm back and forth so much. And that's dangerous. It's dangerous for me. It's dangerous for the church. And it's dangerous for those who are lost. So, well, how is it dangerous for the lost people that the church get double-minded? Because the church is the one who's supposed to be steadfast. We're supposed to have a focal point, and the world is supposed to follow us where we're headed. If we're jumping all over the place, where do they know to go? So we understand then that if we don't fulfill the, the full communion with God, then we will go back. And that's where we get dangerous, to be dangerous. Because we're unstable. We jump back and forth so often. So we need a definite direction. And once we get in the full communion with God, listen to me, once we get in the full communion with God, none of that stuff is going to matter anymore. As a matter of fact, Paul says that I count all that I've lost. And remember, Paul, the apostle Paul, man, he was an educated man. He had power. He had authority in, 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 uh, in the uh, a Jewish religion. He had authority there. Man, he was a wealthy individual. Paul said, I have immersed myself so much in the communion with God that all of that stuff I count as dung. It's nonsense. It's worthless. It's bull stuff. Amen? That's what he was saying. That I count it all. I don't even want it anymore. So the question is, is it possible for you and I to get to where we're not so wrapped up in the world that we don't even care what the world is offering us anymore? Is that possible? The answer is yes. How do we do it? We get into full communion with God. Because I've shared with you many, many times before that the closer I am with God, the less sense the world makes to me. I can't understand it anymore. I don't even desire it anymore. The more I'm in communion with God, 
the more I free myself up to him, then we find out that there's no more faltering. I won't falter. I won't even want to falter. There's nothing over here worth faltering for. And that's what Paul said, man, I count it all loss. It's not a big deal. So when we're faltering, there's no definite direction, but also there's no unshakable conviction. There's no unshakable conviction. Conviction, well, Folks, can I tell you this? We must stand for something. Amen? we got to stand for something. This idea of conviction is the idea of strong identity too. I believe this and I'm convicted with all of my heart. Can you understand? That's how the apostles were able to spend three years with Jesus and then spend the rest of their life suffering for him. In many of them, all of them but one, actually dying martyr's death. How could they do that? How did they not flip-flop back and forth? Because they were totally convicted and convinced of Jesus Christ being the Son of God. That's how they were able to do it, man. They, they, they were totally convicted by that. And it's, we, we've got to understand that, folks, it's easy to live with an everything-goes mentality. Amen? What I mean by that is the, the world. We, we as Christians, we have the conviction of God working in our hearts. So we sometimes come over here and then we get convicted. We come back over here, we, we sense it, but then we go back. But the world has none of that. As a matter of fact, it's real easy for the world to live because they say everything goes. Who gets mad at anybody when they say everything goes? Amen? No one gets mad about it. Because if you want to do this, oh, I agree with you. If you want to do this, oh, well, I'll agree with you there too. If you want to do that, I, I'll agree with you over here. And so this idea of everything goes, my friend, can I tell you, the church should not be able to live that way. But it's easy to live that way if we don't have a conviction. People, as a matter of fact, tend to want it easy. That's why they accept everything. That's why they just, it's like jumping into a stream and just flowing along with the stream. Just go along with it. Everything goes. There's no fighting there. There's no, as a matter of fact, you can go with the flow and not even work. Amen? You don't even have to do anything. But it's when you have that conviction that you turn and you say, no more of this. I can't do this anymore. I'm going to follow after God's standard, His truth, His word, the way He wants it. And I'm going to turn and I'm going to go upstream against it. I'm not wanting to flow this way anymore. It's no longer easy. As a matter of fact, the lost don't even worry about conviction. But I want to show you why the world and how the world thinks it's so easy. They like to hear this verse. The world loves to hear this. Now, this is a text that where you, you, you know the lady who was caught in adultery and she was brought out to Jesus and all the people were surrounded her and they wanted to stone her. And Jesus began to talk to them and, and finally the, he, he said, you without sin cast the first stone. They all left and then this is where we pick it up here. Jesus looks down at her and he says, he asks her, says, Hey, is there anyone here to convict, to condemn you? And this is what she said. She says, no, no one, Lord. And here's what Jesus said to her. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Now, the world loves this verse. Why? Because the world now says, see, Jesus accepted everybody. He was okay. He told her, I don't condemn you anymore. All is well. But here's the problem. Jesus didn't stop there with that comment, amen? He, if he had stopped there, it would have been a different story. He said, I, neither do I condemn you, but listen to what he said. He finished up the verse and he says this, go and sin no more. Now the world likes to hear Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Church, quit condemning people. And you know what? Listen to me. That's true. Church, we shouldn't be condemning people. We shouldn't be condemning people. But here's the problem. The world says, don't judge us. Don't you condemn us. Jesus even told this to a lady caught in adultery. But what they don't go on is to say, but he also looked at her and said, now as a result of this, change how you are. Do not do that life any longer. You can't 
do it anymore. I'm not going to condemn you because I am here to forgive you. I am here to bless you. I am here to have full communion with you. But I cannot do that and allow you to continue to do the things you're doing. My friends, listen to me. We as the church cannot be condemning people, but it's okay for us to say, but sin is sin. Sin is sin. Who tells who what sin is? Back to this. The Word of God will tell us what sin is. So then we have the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We have the Word speaking in through our lives. And my friends, we are to not condemn anybody. But we cannot condone sin either. We need to be standing up. We need to have that conviction. We need to be telling the world, this is sin, and we're not going to watch it happen anymore. We're going to choose to stand up on the things that are real. We're going to choose life. I shared in the first service today, man, I, I've been even hearing uh, evangelical pastors that I think are beginning to falter, and I hear them say, you know, again, we have this big thing coming up called the election on Tuesday, and I hear even well-known, very popular, big church pastors that are saying, we cannot be voting on issues. My friends, can I tell you something? That I believe with all my heart, and I'm convicted of this, that I believe life is a good issue to be voting on. Amen? Amen. I believe killing unborn babies is something we vote on. And I believe we, we go in that direction. I, I believe freedom. I believe freedom, personal freedom, is something we choose and we vote on. That's an issue I think we vote on. I, I think being able to call things what they are, I think that's an issue we vote on. And so when you go in on Tuesday, man, I, I, to sit and say, all we do is we vote on a personality, my friend, that's crazy. We got to vote. We cannot condemn the world, but my friends, we got to say sin is sin. Abortion is wrong. Sin is sin, whether the world agrees with it or not. We've got to stand up as the church, and we've, we've got to say this is what God says. John W. Rittenbaugh said this, if we lack faith and conviction in what brought us out, we will regress to what we were before. If I don't have conviction on Jesus Christ and his word and the things that he did in my life, if I don't have conviction and faith in that, that's what brought me out of sin. That's what brought me from being lost to being saved. That if I now come over here and I don't have a faith in that and I don't have a conviction in that, it won't be long till I regress back to where I was. Now, not being lost. We already settled that, right? We settled that. We can't be lost. It's not lost and saved, lost and saved. But I can sure enter back into the things of this world. And my friends, we need to be having unshakable conviction no matter what the world tells us. Have that unshakable conviction. Sin is sin. Yes, do not condemn this world. Do not condemn this world. But do not go along with this world. Go and sin no more. That's the call for the church. And the last thing on that when faltering is that we'll have no influence to others. And here's what happens when we don't have a strong conviction. Here's what begins to happen is that we basically accept our limitations. We begin to accept our limitations. Can I tell you this church? We are limited in our own power. Amen. As a matter of fact, I can't do anything. I, I, I do. I mean, I, I can't do this job. I shared with you before, I hope one day y'all don't figure out I don't know what I'm doing because I don't. Because I can't do this job. We can't make a difference in the world under our own power. As a matter of fact, Jesus, whenever he was talking to his apostles and he was talking to them about things that were going to be going on and they were asking, how can we do this? How come we can't do what we're supposed to do? And the Bible tells us in Matthew 19, 26, it says, then Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men it is impossible. But, now see again, he didn't stop there, praise the Lord. With God, with man, these things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. We begin to, if we're unshaken, if, if we begin to falter, what we're beginning to do is we're beginning to say, we accept our limitations, we can't make a difference, our church can't make a difference, we can't as individuals make a difference. 
Oh, but here's the deal. When we begin to not falter any longer, we begin to say, God, you can make a difference. Because it's impossible with me, but God, it's, it's, it's absolutely possible with you. My friends, listen to me. Our nation is in trouble, and if it's up to us, we're not going to get out of it. But with God, it's possible. I even shared with you last week that I believe we're in trouble, but I don't believe it's too late for America. I believe it's, it's, it's time for t- such a time as this that we stand up and we begin to influence others. Do not accept our limitations. Do not begin to think that it's all on us because it's not all on us. It's all on Him. And through Him, hey, here's the good news, through Him, First Baptist West can change Lawton. Well, now this has been a good place for an amen, folks. Through Him, First Baptist West can change Lawton through Jesus, through him working through us. Yes, we are limited. We do have limited resources. We do have limited numbers. We have limited space. We have limited. We, we, we have limited. But our God has no limits. He can change America through us. I shared in the first service again as well that my, my, my preacher, what I call my preacher dad, Brother Jess McDowell, great, great friend of mine, great friend of our family. Man, he was like my daughter's uh, grandpa. And Jess has gone to be with the Lord now. But man, he, when we were at Milfabe, even before I became a pastor, Jess McDowell used to stand in the, the pulpit and sing. And he had sing, God, little is much when God is in it. Boy, I tell you what, one day I'm going to get to hear Jess sing that song again. I can't wait because he did an amazing, man, there was something heavy on me. Boy, I was like, woo, little is much. Harold, I'm, I'm much when God is in this. I, my, my preaching is little, but it's much when God is in it. Our church's effort are little, but it's much when God is in it. Amen? Little is much when God is in it. When we accept our limitations, we're in trouble because then we're saying all this depends on us. And my friends, that's what begins to happen when we falter. So with all of that, with all of that, I want to come to this point. It's decision time. Elijah looked at the people. He looked at the people and he said, how long are you going to falter between these two things? It's time to choose. And he said, it's time to choose. You got two choices. You got Baal and you got Jehovah God. He said, if the Lord be God, serve him with everything you are. But if Baal be God, and that's what you're convinced of, serve him. But today it is time for all of you here, it is time to choose which one. That was his call. So today, my friends, as your pastor, as your friend, I stand before you today that I believe with all my heart we are entering into a time in our society, entering into a time of our history where God is calling us and saying, Church, it's time for you to decide. It's time for you to decide. And you've got a choice. And the choice is, are you going to serve God or are you going to serve society? It's time. And if listen, he said, if Jehovah, if God, if the Lord is God, then men serve him. But if you're not, if you're not truly convinced that that's it, then the only other thing you can say is society is God. And it's time for you to serve society. Because he says you can't do both. Church, it's decision time, I believe. And I'm not just standing up here as as just a hellfire brimstone preacher telling you this. But I am convinced with all my heart that God is calling the church, it's time. We don't have a whole lot of time left. And I believe we're, I told you last week, I believe we're at a crossroads. And he's calling the church up, man. He's calling the church out. He's saying, man, you, you decide. Get on one side or the other. But I don't want this faltering anymore. You remember there was a, a, a church in the book of Revelation that he talked about. That said, you're neither hot nor cold. You're back and forth. 
He said, man, I, I want you, and he told the church of Laodicea, I, I need you to be hot or I need you to be cold. I do not need you back and forth. He says, as a matter of fact, those that do that, he said, what it, what's going to happen is I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. What he said is, if you're hot and cold and you're back and forth and you're faltering, going one way or the other, he said, literally, here's what God says. He said, it's making me sick to watch. He said, it's time to choose, church. But it's not time. Don't, don't say, oh, well, yeah, I, 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 I want to be a part of First Baptist West because I think they ought to be choosing. No. It's not the church. It's not First Baptist West that chooses. It's the individuals of First Baptist West that he's calling to choose. So you can't ride the church. I'll live, I'll falter, but I'll ride the church. I want the church. To make the stand, but I don't want to be with it. I want to be able to go back and forth. Uh-uh. That's not the call. The call is choose God or society. And I want to prove it to you that he's not asking for the church, the collective church, First Baptist West, to make the decision, let members have no say in it. Because if you'll remember back to uh, in the book of Luke, chapter 9, Jesus asked his apostles, said, who who do people say that I am? And they began to say, well, we believe you're this and that. They believe you're this, this, and this. But then he comes to them in Luke 9, 20, and he looks at them and says, okay, who do you say that I am? Quit riding society now. Quit riding the group. Who do you say that I am? So today I believe God is looking at each one of you. He's looking at me. He's looking at all you at home. He says, I don't care. Do not answer me. Who do you think First Baptist West calls, calls me? Don't, don't answer who do you think I am to that collective body. Because you can't ride that collective body. So he looks at each one of us and each one of us has to decide who do we Say that he is. Who do you, each one of you here today, each one of you watching today, who do you say that he is? It's decision time. It's decision time for all of us. And I believe history, history is being true. History is now being made by the decisions we make. Because here's the thing that I want to close with. It's decision time. If the Lord is God, then here's some things we need to do. If the Lord is God, then the first thing we need to do is trust Him. Do we trust Him? Do we, do we, do we trust His Word? Do we, do we trust what He tells us to do? That if we're no longer faltering, if we're standing here today and we say, I choose to serve God. I, I choose Him. I don't want society anymore. I want to serve God. Then, folks, we've got to trust what He says here. We've got to trust that when He says something is wrong, it's wrong. We've got to trust when He says something is right, it's right. We've got to trust that when it's time and He says it's time to do something, folks, we've got to trust that we can do it. Trust Him. But not only then do we trust him, but then we have to serve him. If he's the Lord, and we're going to choose him, then folks, we've got to serve him. We can't say, well, I trust him, but, and I love him, but then not do what he says. As a matter of fact, Jesus even came to him one time and says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do what I've asked you to do? Why do you say that I'm the Lord, but yet you're not following me? You're not doing what I ask you to do. So if I am, and if that's who what you say you're going to do, then folks, we've got to serve him. And then the last one is we've got to present him. It's time for us to present him. What I mean by present is raise him up. Live him, live life showing Jesus through us. Holding him up. And saying, hey, this is Jesus. This is what he calls us to be. This is what he calls us to do. If the Lord is God, then trust Him, serve Him, present Him. 
My friends, church, if God is, if the Lord is God and we're going to follow after Him, then we can no longer falter. It is time for us to decide. It is time for us to stand on it. It's time for us to go to the ballot boxes on Tuesday and, and time for all of us to vote. It's time for all of us to vote the way that we believe that God is leading us to choose life, to choose freedom, to choose all of these things. Even though popular pastors are telling us those are not issues we need to, need to look at. My friends, can I tell you that is a life straight from hell. Issues are what we need to look at. Issues are what we need to look at. And we got to be strong in this, united in this. Now, this was the end of my sermon until the first service. Because I want to share one more thing with you, and I promise you, this is the closing. I told you we're wrapping it up, but this is really it. Because in the first service, man, I was about ready to wrap this thing up. And then all of a sudden, God brought, took my eyes back down to that last part of the text that we read. And it literally broke my heart. And I want to share it with you today. This broke my heart. And it still breaks my heart. That They heard this. They said, "It's how long are you going to do it? If God be God, then serve him. If Baal be God, serve him. But you must choose. Listen to what it says right here. Here's the heartbreaking part of it. He says, and Elijah came to the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And listen to, listen to the ending. But the people answered him not a word. The choice was there. He told them, you must choose. But the Bible says they didn't say a thing. Why that breaks my heart is, as I was doing this in the first sermon, why, why this breaks my heart is by not answering, they answered. By not choosing, they chose. Because you, you, you got a choice. You can't sit and say, I'm not going to make a choice. Because when God calls you and you don't make a choice, you've made the choice. So my friend, listen to me. I want to call out to you today as your pastor and your friend. I want all y'all at home, listen. God has called us. Quit faltering. Choose today. If you're going to serve God, serve God. If you're going to serve Baal, serve, serve Baal. Folks, and if we sit and say, well, let's just be quiet. Let's not answer. Let's not make any waves. What we've done is we've not answered God's call. They said not a stinking word. Wow. I believe, I believe it's time for the church to quit saying nothing. I believe it's time for the church to quit cowering down faltering the hope in society will just leave us alone or maybe we can get along. I think it's time for the church to answer God. Answer him. And I believe God is calling out, church, here's your choice. Answer me. Answer me. It's time. It's time. And folks, you and I were placed here for such a time as this, right now. Right now. I'd like you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. And uh, the praise team is not going to start anything yet. Because I, I want us to take a moment. I want you at home to take a moment. Because what we're going to do is we're, we're going to take some time. And I believe God has he called me to do this in the first service. He's calling me again to do it in the second service here. But I believe that, folks, we are such a... a, a a I almost want to say a dangerous time in history. That I believe we need to come before the presence of God and we need to pray. And I don't mean just, oh, pray God take care of us. I mean pray God let the church be strong. Let the church rise up in this election. Let the church vote for life. Let this church vote for, for freedom. Let this, vote, let this church vote for what is sinful, Lord, that we will call it sin. God, take care of the church and use us. 
Let us rise up. So my friend, what I want you to do here in just the quietness of the time, we're going to take just about a minute. I'm going to ask you to really begin to pray for our nation. Pray for Tuesday. Pray for God to work in us and through us. Oh, Father, I pray with the union of my brothers and sisters here in this, this, this room, with my brothers and sisters who are joining us by live stream. Father, joining our hearts together, praying for our nation. God, praying for next week. God, I think for too long we've allowed ourselves to be pushed down. We've been tamped down, Lord. And I believe you are calling the church to step up. You are calling the church to stand out. God, you are calling the church to vote. You are calling this church to vote and the whole church to vote our spirit of what you're leading us. God, not to be lied to by the world, but to choose today. Choose today. And God, we want to claim you as God. And I pray that every person in this room, I pray for every person that's watching, that God, we have made that decision and we'll no longer be quiet. We'll no longer let things go by. The Father will not be a condemning group. We're not called to condemn the world. We're not called to condemn anybody. But Lord, we're called to love them. And I pray, God, that we would love this world as you loved it and that you still love it. Ah, but Father, I pray that we'd be We'd be willing to stand and call sin, sin. And that God would not be lied to even from the pulpits. But Father, we would stand strong and choose life above everything else. And that God, we would choose freedom. And that God, we would choose, we would choose the ability, Lord, to, to have religious freedom to speak truth from our pulpits to not be told what we can say and not say to be able to call sin as sin and Lord not be worried about what the world is thinking about us so Father I, I pray that the choice for your, your people would be clear Father, I pray for our nation that whatever happens, that God, you would bring a peace to us. And God, I know that there's reports that people are already paying money to be able to organize revolt and destruction if the election doesn't go the way they want it. So, Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus and by his power that you would confound the enemy, Lord, that you would bring an end to that. That, God, you would bring a sweetness to, to this country. But, Father, you would bring an end to those who are seeking destruction. But, Father, if the election goes the other way, I pray that we would still realize, God, you are in control. And that, God, we would trust you. And, God, we would commit ourselves to you. Father, I pray that you'd be all over this next week. And that, Father, your power can be displayed through the love of your church. And God, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray, God, for strengthening to them. 
And I pray for our church here at West that, God, we would be that church that stands on conviction and be strong. God, I lift up Tuesday to you. I lift up this next week. I lift up this next year. Father, just take it. Take it. My friends, in just the next moment, we're going to have the praise team lead us. If God's speaking to your heart and you need to come to the altars and pray, please come and pray. You at home, continue in the spirit of prayer. But if you've settled that and things are settled, and man, you know that, God, I'm going to stand for you now. God, convict my heart. Give me that strength. Let me not falter anymore. Then I want you to stand. I want you to sing and praise the Lord together with us, okay? But I'll be down front. You can call our office and someone will be there to visit with you. We'll pray with you, whatever you need. Father, hear our prayers today. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you to stand. Would you join us? And come if you